So it's official, Andretti's bid to enter Formula One in 2025 or 2026 has been rejected. And this announcement by Formula One management, FOM, uh, quite amazingly has come only two days, only two days after an exclusive article came out from The Athletic by Luke Smith on why Andretti is not waiting for a green light to build its F1 team. You cannot make this stuff up. This is F1 tomfoolery at its best. The timing of that is unbelievable. Now, most of the time, I keep the uploads to this channel gaming-based. Obviously, we do have the F1 Reddit, so we laugh a little bit at real-life Formula 1 memes and such, but most of the time, it's, it's gaming stuff. But I felt like this bit of news coming out of Formula 1 is a bit too big to maybe ignore, and something I actually just want to discuss, really, because it is a big deal, you know? We've, we've been having these talks about an 11th team on the grid for a while I personally have had Andretti modded into my F1 career mode series, you know, because it's something that myself and so many of you, at, you know, watching want to happen that it, you know, became popular enough that, it, you know, it makes sense to mod Andretti into the game because it, it's a popular thing. And I think it's going to be a very unpopular decision that uh, FOM have come out with today. Let me quickly circle back to that exclusive article from The Athletic on Andretti's preparations because it really kind of now... Uh, puts into context how devastating this will definitely be for the American uh, outfit trying to get into F1. To summarize the article into the kind of headline things, um, there was a first look at the car in the wind tunnel. So, so Andretti and General Motors working together in unison had actually developed a mule car to put in a wind tunnel to actually do some CFD analysis and some proper um, aerodynamic analysis to help, you know, build a good race car. They were hoping to have a full-size prototype chassis uh, planned by mid-2024. They had a team size of over 120 people based out in uh, in the US working on this. And General Motors, GM, were heavily involved in these F1 design projects. And th the thought would be eventually GM would help build their own bespoke engine for Andretti. Obviously, we've heard that in the form of Andretti Cadillac. You know, as Cadillac being a brand of G General Motors. And quite funny, at the end of the article, the journalist Luke Smith uh, noted what happened happens if F1 say no to the entry. Well, uh, we won't have to pretend anymore because it's happened. So they weren't just like half arsing it. Like they were actually really giving it a good go and they'd already, you know, plowed on with preparations no knowing that they, they still had to get their application uh, greenlit. But that, you know, that was the mantra they wanted to go with is just, look, we're going to try and focus in on what we can control, which is actually building up this project. Um, and, you know, we, we hope it gets accepted and then we've already got a head start because we've not just waited until the green light to get going. They've already gotten going. So, you know, they were trying very much so to make a successful project. And their application was actually somewhat successful in a way because the FIA actually already approved it. Now, the FOM, Formula One Management, and the FIA are two different entities. FOM is kind of F1, Liberty Media, the commercial side of Formula One, but they also have like a final say. The FIA is the governing body, so that's the sporting kind of thing. They actually thought, yeah, no, th this, th this is fine to us. To us, this is completely, you know, it's all good with us, you know. The governing body says yes. And over here, the commercial rights holder says no. So kind of, you know, the biggest indication, I think, that F1 is more of a business and an entertainment entity than it is a sport because it kind of feels a bit unsportsmanship to not allow a new team into the sport when the governing body, the ones that make rules and well, it's in the name, Govern, uh, you know, Motorsport, have said yes to this new team potentially entering. And not only have FOM rejected Andretti's bid, they've really gone in on them. They've cooked them. They've absolutely cooked them in terms of why they are rejecting them. So one of the main concerns is over building a 2025 to 2026 car. So Andretti's bid was to enter F1 in 2025 or 2026. But that effectively means that they, they, they haven't been able to focus on one year. So they'd be, if they got, if let's say they actually entered, they would enter in 2025, they've built a car to that regulation 
nations and then would have to immediately switch then to building for 2026. So to quote them, on this basis, we do not believe that the applicant would be a competitive participant. That obviously actually does make a little bit of sense. It does. It does make a little bit of sense. I think a stronger thing would have been just going for 2026, that new set of regulations. But the problem is those regulations haven't even been fully ratified and confirmed by the FI by F1. They're still kind of making them and I think later this year, the plan is to confirm them. So that would be a problem. You know, they'd kind of be waiting around for those to be, to be done. Another problem for Andretti's bid, according to F1, is basically the fact that they're going to be a customer team entering Formula 1. They are, they, you know, the plan would be eventually that General Motors would build an engine for them, you know, under the branding of maybe Cadillac or whatever. You know, GM was going to make them an engine eventually. But entering Formula 1 in 2025 and 2026, they would be a customer team. And they did not look at that very nicely. They said a novice constructor in partnership with a new entrant PU supplier would have a significant challenge to overcome and that working from GM from the outset would have enhanced its credibility. So if they had said that they were going to come into F1 with its own engine with GM, that would have boosted their chances. But even then, that first part of the quote is saying they would have had a significant challenge anyway to overcome because then you're building a car and an engine at the same time. Obviously, to two kind of different entities doing that but in partnership and it's tough it's tough out here basically is what f1 is saying there i mean to me it doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world especially if they're eventually looking to build their own engine because we are we're gonna have i think six engines in 2026 supplied to 10 teams mercedes has already signed three of those teams so really there are five engines covering seven teams so i think there are still plenty of engines to go around obviously red bull is making their own engine so they're only going to supply themselves and their new visa cash app sponsored by every financial person in the world rb team um so then that, that's one less engine. So you have four engines covering five teams. So you start whittling it down and you see that there is scope for one of those engine brands just to supply one more team. Is it really that bad? And actually, it's probably a benefit to that engine manufacturer because then they get two lots of data points. But nevertheless, that's where F1 draw a line there when it comes to the engine. And then finally, one of the most outlandish things here is that F1 said its research show that F1 would bring value to the Andretti brand rather than the other way around. Oh, that is that is a sucker punch and a half and that it would not be able to identify any material expected positive effect on CRH financial results, i.e. F1 financially would not benefit to Andretti joining the sport. Now, that is, you know, you, you might say fair enough, you know, F1's done its research, but you then look at the other American team already in the sport, Haas. Do they really bring more value to F1 than F1 brings to them? Haas F1 team is basically one big marketing ploy for the Haas machines that get used for like engineering and stuff by Gene Haas, you know, his other company basically. And if we're being real, it's not even that because now most of the younger audience of Formula One, they're not going to care about CNC machines and, and Haas branded CMC machines. So you can also argue how much benefit is Haas, Gene Haas, even getting from F1 in terms of that way. But absolutely, F1, how can you say they are getting more benefit than Haas are from Haas being there? The only reason Haas are in the sport is because when they joined, F1 was in a very different landscape. I remember that year when Haas joined, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, we were only just starting to kind of open up the doors of social media with Formula One. And it was still obviously, what, years away from Liberty Media buying Formula One. So F1 was in a very different landscape. But now it's, and uh, now we're in that different land, and now we're in a completely different landscape to, to then. And F1's now just kind of saying they're too big, which is crazy to me. I would like to see like the, the the workings out of this research because surely a new team just brings two more seats in a market which is very difficult to break into. Like the fact that you've got 
Charles Leclerc, you know, Lando signing bigger contracts, which is all well and good for them and for, for those teams. You know, Verstappen's on big con on a on long contract. These drivers signing long contracts, it actually kind of makes the driver market very dull and boring. It's kind of, you know, you know, for me, coming from the gaming side of things, I love seeing driver market madness. You know, you guys, know, if you watch my game videos, you'll know that. Obviously, I know that's a game. This is real life. Very, very different. But it is a shame. I, I feel like even compared to a couple of years ago, the F1 driver market was way more exciting. Silly season was way, way more exciting. Whereas now you have these long, you have these big drivers locking in big contracts with the big teams and there's less seats to go around. A new team would just add to the pool of available seats in Formula One. But alas, F1's research whatever that is, um, has said no. No, it's not going to bring much value. And then on the basis of the application as it stands, we do not believe that the applicant has shown it would add value to the championship. We conclude that the applicant's application to participate in the championship should not be successful. So that's that for now, I guess, because they have opened up the door and said that maybe they would be open to a bid in 2028 if GM are making an engine for Andretti. So there is potential in the future, but by then we're going to have a new Concord agreement. That's the agreement that all the teams and F1 come into. Uh, it's going to be changing in 2026, and that's going to maybe make life even more difficult for Andretti because right now the way F1 prize money works is there's a pie, which is the load of money, and it's divvied up between the 10 teams in Formula 1. Now if Andretti come in, the pie is then sliced by 11, which, by the way, I, I just think stupid. F1 should be adding to the pie. F1 have enough money to add to the pie. I've always thought this in the last couple of years when we've been talking about a new team, you know, slicing up the pie differently. Why aren't we just making the pie bigger? Why isn't F1 able to fund a, a bigger prize pool? Like, like you, they've had the most successful years they've ever had in the last couple of years, and they're unable to think about increasing the prize pool to allow for the length of the team. Instead, they're on about the pie getting smaller for each team. And that's why the actual F1 teams themselves have always been completely against a new team joining now in Formula 1. Uh, obviously, Renault were a little bit open because they might have been the one supplying Andretti. McLaren were maybe a little bit lukewarm compared to the other eight teams, which were just like, no, we don't want a new team in Formula 1. They're just not going to add anything and they're going to take away from our money. Um, and the Concord Agreement in uh, right now had the figure of $200 million as a dilution fee that the new team would have to pay in to be divvied up. Basically, $200 million would be divvied up to the 10 current teams to basically kind of grease the wheels and go, we're sorry for slicing the pie by 11, not to 10. Here's some money to make up for the shortfall. In 2028, by the time that comes through and maybe Andretti bid again, the Concord Agreement might have changed. It probably will have changed. And there are talks of the dilution fee tripling because since the last time the Concord Agreement was made, F1 is an, in a much more successful position. So the F1 teams are going to vie for the dilution fee to be even higher than it is right now. So even though there is a door open for Andretti in the future, it seems like that door might be even less open than the door that was open now, which has been slammed shut by FOM. Playing devil's advocate, you can see some of the points F1 are making. You can see some of the, you know, reasons why F1 teams maybe don't want to do that. But then that also comes down to fundamentally then, you know, things that are even bigger of a problem in the sport of teams controlling a sport um, that they compete in themselves is just a little bit odd anyway. It always has been odd when rule changes have been voted on by teams, etc, etc. But the FOM has had their say. So no Andretti in 2025 or 2026. So let me know what you guys make of that, anything I've talked about in this video. If you have enjoyed this video talking about real life F1, let me know if you want me to do more when, when like a good topic arises. And if you are new around here, then do get subscribed for weekly Formula 1 content. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.